Admiral Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk about um, Soviet military involvement in the Dutch New Guinea crisis. Um, in this crisis, there are some similarities with the Cuban crisis that Michael Blobs was just talking about. The two operations, two Soviet operations, overlap in time. Um, and once again, you have the USSR secretly deploying personnel and armed forces in developing country. In this case, it's Indonesia rather than Cuba. And the Americans also use aerial reconnaissance to monitor events around Dutch New Guinea. They're overflights by U 2 photo reconnaissance aircraft. <coughs> So I'm going to start off by explaining the background to the crisis and show how Dutch New Guinea became a Cold War issue. I'll examine why, so I'll examine the military support that the Soviet Union secretly provided Indonesia in 1962 and see how this interacted with American efforts to get a peaceful negotiated settlement between Indonesia and the Netherlands. Finally, I'll discuss why the Soviet Union and Indonesia agreed to the deployment of Soviet personnel and consider whether there was any connection to the Soviet operation in Cuba. The Dutch New Guinea dispute arose from the process of Dutch decolonization in Southeast Asia, as I'm sure most of you are aware. In 1949, the Netherlands gave independence to most of the Dutch East Indies, thereby creating Indonesia, but chose to retain the New Guinea portion of the colony. The Indonesian president, Sukarno, opposed this colonial holdover and he pushed the Dutch to pull out. But the Dutch refused. They argued that the Papuan people in New Guinea were ethnically distinct from the Indonesians and should be given the right to exercise national self-determination on their own. Negotiations on the issue became deadlocked and Sukarno applied increasing uh, economic political and military pressure on the Dutch to make them give way. In 1957, he seized Dutch commercial interests in Indonesia. In 1960, he broke off diplomatic relations. The Indonesians began to carry out small-scale guerrilla infiltrations in Dutch New Guinea, and they drew up plans in early 1962 for a large-scale military attack. The Soviets, led by Khrushchev, strongly backed the Indonesian campaign. Moscow provided Sukarno diplomatic and propaganda support. More importantly, Khrushchev supplied Indonesia with a large amount of modern weaponry. Between 1958 and 1961, Indonesia bought more than $700 million worth of arms from the Soviet Union, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And these purchases greatly expanded and modernized the Indonesian Navy which received destroyers, um, a light cruiser, and submarines. The Indonesian Air Force was equipped with the latest Soviet military jet aircraft, such as MiG-21 fighters and Tu-16 medium bombers. The arms were sold on credit, and the terms were very generous, giving one third discount and cost price. It would take time for Soviet block instructors to properly train the Indonesians how to use these weapons. But it did enable Indonesia to pose a great military threat to Dutch New Guinea. The American intelligence agencies monitored the Soviet arms supplies and the escalating Indonesian campaign. The Americans had good sources of information. Soon after, two major Soviet Indonesian arms deals were signed in early 1961, the CIA obtained what it called, quote, documentary evidence, unquote about the agreements from, quote, reliable Indonesian sources, unquote. The CIA later stated it had, quote, excellent contractual information, unquote, on the terms of its Soviet military aid was given to Indonesia. Some of this seems to have been signals intelligence. The CIA later reported that, quote, intercepted messages, unquote, showed a Soviet military aid program was subject to some delays in May 1962. We now know it's called the transfer equipment to Cuba. This intelligence was shared with the Australians and the British, and to some extent with the Dutch as well. The United States was very concerned by the growing Soviet influence in Indonesia and the risk of war between Indonesia and the Dutch. And so this colonial dispute took on a Cold War edge. 
The American believe Khrushchev was exploiting the Dutch New Guinea issue to try and draw Sukarno into the Soviet camp. He could outbid the Americans on the issue. The Americans were reluctant to supply Sukarno arms or support the claim to Dutch New Guinea because it would have fed the Netherlands, which was a NATO ally. The Soviet Union wasn't inhibited, wasn't so inhibited by these concerns. It could wholeheartedly support Sukarno and give him the arms he wanted to take back Dutch New Guinea. If a full-scale Indonesian Dutch war broke out, the Americans feared it would push Sukarno even closer into the Soviet camp and strengthen the Indonesian Communist Party, the PKI. Indonesia might be lost to the West, and this would be a major blow because Indonesia was a big country, the sixth largest population in the world of 92 million in 1962. It had valuable war resources like rubber, tin, and oil, and an important strategic location not far from countries like Laos and South Vietnam, which really were struggling with communist insurgencies. So mindful of these strategic Cold War concerns, the Americans pushed the Dutch and Indonesians to reach a negotiated settlement. And as the price of the deal, as a price of keeping uh, Soviet so Indonesians neutral, they were willing to see the Dutch removed from Dutch New Guinea. So the Americans organized talks in the US here in Washington, near Washington, in March 1962. The talks made no progress, though, they came bogged down. And the Dutch started to reinforce their position in Dutch New Guinea, sending out reinforcements, more ships and troops, to try and cope with the Indonesian infiltrators. It was at this point when negotiations stalled and the Dutch reinforcing their position in New Guinea that Sukarno appears to decide to ask Khrushchev the Soviet submarines and aircraft manned by Soviet crews. The Indonesian foreign minister, Subanjo, went to Moscow in May to buy new arms, and he signed an arms deal in Moscow on the 8th of May. No details are publicly disclosed, but later accounts from Soviet sources, especially Christos memoirs, give a picture of what was agreed. It seems to be the Indonesians who requested the weapons and Soviet crews to man them. Khrushchev later recalled that Sukarno had taken the initiative and sent Subhanahu to Moscow to ask for, quote, submarines, aircraft, and commanders for these things, unquote. And Khrushchev gave Sukarno what he wanted. The Soviets agreed to supply the Indonesians with six diesel electric whiskey class submarines, as the NATO code name, whiskey class, and six TU 16 medium bombers. These aircraft with a TU-16 KS variant, which is modified to carry two Cometa air to surface anti-shipping missiles. Um, each TU-16 TU KS would carry two Cometas, and these were familiar weapons, so the range of 70 to 90 kilometers and a one-ton warhead. The Soviet pilots would fly the TU-16 bombers, the Soviet seamen would man the submarines. Khrushchev even seemed willing the Soviet piloted planes to take part in combat against the Dutch. When told by Sukant, when told by Subanjo that chances of an agreement with the Dutch over New Guinea were not great, Khrushchev said, quote, it's a war that could to some extent serve as a proving ground for our pilots. We'll see how well our missiles work, unquote. The Soviets quickly dispatched weapons to Indonesia the submarines coming from the Soviet Pacific Fleet. Former Soviet naval officers who took part in the operation have since written accounts of what happened. One was Rudolf Rushikov, who was a naval officer of a whiskey class submarine. He recalled that in May 1962, his submarine and one other was ordered to leave Vladivostok and sail to Indonesia. When they arrived 15 days later at the port of Surabaya in Java, they were ordered to change into Indonesian uniforms. Four more Soviet manned submarines and a support tender soon joined them. The Americans followed the passage of these Soviet arms. By mid-May, the CIA knew that the Soviets had agreed to supply Spandio with additional submarines and aircraft. Although it seemed unaware of how Soviet crews. And the Americans monitored the delivery of the equipment. The CIA detected the arrival of six Whiskey class submarines in Surabaya and reported on the 29th of June 
that six TU-16 KF aircraft, sorry, KS aircraft, had landed at Jakarta Airfield. The CIA was perturbed by the speed of these deliveries, warning that they were, quote, the quickest ever noted for such complex equipment under Soviet arms deal with a non-block country. As the Soviet arms started to arrive, the Indonesian military command prepared for a large-scale attack on the Dutch. On the 22nd of June, the Indonesian military high command issued orders for Operation Jaya Wijaya, which would be a combined island assault on Biak, um, an island which is central to Dutch defences of New Guinea. In the operation, the Indonesian Navy and Air Force would first seek to establish air and sea superiority. Indonesian paratroopers would then be dropped on Biak, followed by amphibious landing. Once Biak was captured, the city of Hollandia on Dutch New Guinea would be attacked. This was an ambitious operation, far bigger and more complex than the guerrilla infiltrations the Indonesian military had carried out until that point. And it was set to take place very soon in August, August 1962. The forces allocated Operation Jaya Jaya suggests that at least some Soviet personnel would take part. The planned attacking force included 12 submarines and 20 Tu-16 bombers. But the Indonesians only had six submarines. So the other six would have to be Soviet manned submarines moored in Surabaya Harbor. Indonesia did have 20 Tu-16 bombers. So on paper, the Indonesian Air Force could carry out this part of the operation. But the Australian air attache in Jakarta was told by an Indonesian source in July that the Indonesian Air Force only had trained crews for six TU-16s, which again suggests the Soviets had to fill the gap. In fact, Soviet military officers appeared to help the Indonesians drop their military plans. And the Americans received reports that the USSR was encouraging the Indonesians to use force. In July, there were visits to Indonesia by Air Marshal Konstantin Vershinin, the commander of the Soviet Air Force, and Anastas Mikoya, the Soviet First Deputy Chairman. A quote, very reliable, unquote, Indonesian source told the Australian military attaché in Jakarta that Vershinin had pushed the Indonesians to take New Guinea by force. The CIA later reported that both Vershinin and Mikoya urged Indonesians to attack Dutch New Guinea using <coughs> discovered that Soviet personnel were manning the submarines and aircraft in Indonesia. An American intelligence report in early July warned that, quote, the 6W class, that's Whiskey class, submarines which arrived in Surabaya in June were entirely Soviet manned. At present, all six submarines still with Soviet crews are stationed in Surabaya. Crews of two of these submarines are wearing Indonesian naval uniforms or insignia. Indonesian naval officers jokingly refer to these men as volunteers. So the American point of view, it's become even more important to try and avoid um, a war between Indonesia and Dutch New Guinea, and try and restart negotiations. And Sukarno had not completely given up on negotiations. The build-up of Indonesian military forces would give the ability soon to launch a full-scale attack on Dutch New Guinea. But it also be used to try and intimidate the Dutch and win the territory through coercive diplomacy. Encouraged by the Americans, Sakhalin and the Dutch resumed negotiations in July. Progress was difficult though, because by this point the Indonesians had hardened their negotiating position. They were demanding more. Subanjo asked for Dutch New Guinea to be transferred to Indonesia by the 31st of December 1962. When the Dutch resisted, Subandra announced that he would break off talks which draw to Indonesia within three days. His departure would signify full-scale war. The final preparations for Operation Jaya Wijaya are already underway. Starting on the 17th of July, the Indonesian command began to move troops from their bases and assemble the invasion fleet in the waters around the Bangai Islands on the east coast of Sulawesi, in Pelling Bay and Bangkalan Bay. The Indonesians planned to carry out initial air attacks on the Dutch targets on the 10th of August, 
the Sultan Viat, which followed the 12th of August. The Americans and the Dutch were tracking the movement of the Indonesian forces, and this is what the Americans used, used to spy aircraft, which seemed to be flown by its duty air command rather by the CIA. They could see that a large scale attack was imminent, but they had one certain target where it be. The Americans tried to deter the Indonesians from using force. On the evening of 26th of July, President Kennedy met privately with Subandrio. According to Subandrio's later account of the meeting, the President warned him that Jakarta used force would have to send units of the American 7th Fleet to evacuate American citizens from Indonesia. Subandrio and other Indonesian officials seem to interpreted this as a threat that the Americans militarily intervene if there was an Indonesian-Dutch war. The Americans also pressed the Dutch to make concessions over handover date. And through these efforts, they managed to persuade Subandrio to spare the talk and bridge the gap between the two sides. On the 15th of August, Subandrio signed an agreement with the Dutch in New York, which settled the issue of Dutch New Guinea. Under this agreement, the United Nations would take control over Dutch New Guinea and then transfer the territory to Indonesia on the 1st of May 1963. So slightly later than Spanish originally wanted, but still much earlier than Dutch had planned at the start of 1962. The Papuans have to rely on the ill defined act of free choice to determine their views, what they wanted to do. As I'm sure you know, it's never really happened. There was a referendum in Papua New Guinea wanted to join. Uh, Indonesia or not. So essentially, the Dutch were browbeaten into handing New Guinea over to Indonesia. So, so Bandit did not, so, so come, not need to launch his military offensive. But former Soviet service personnel have claimed that if Operation Jailway Jail was launched, the Soviet manned submarines at least would have participated in it. Rushkov claimed his submarine had received orders from Admiral Sergei Gorshkov command in chief of the Soviet Navy to sail towards waters west of New Guinea and sink any shipping after 5th of August. Gennady Malkov, an officer of another Soviet submarine, also claimed he had orders to attack at midnight on 15th of August um, oil storage tanks at the port, the port of Malkari in Dutch New Guinea and torpedo a Dutch frigate nearby. Both Rushkov and Malkov claimed that later on orders came through to halt the attack and turn to harbour. There's been some skepticism about whether it's actually true or not, whether the veterans are actually, um, I'd say, fantasizing, maybe embellishing their memoirs. But Western intelligence services also had some indications that Soviet cruise submarines were allocated to the Indonesian invasion fleet and would take part in the attack. The CIA reported in August Indonesian units were operational readiness, including, quote, the large task force located in Bangkalan Bay in the Celebes, sort of easy, and the six Soviet manned submarines attached to it, unquote. The British Joint Intelligence Committee later noted that there was, quote, some evidence that Soviet manned submarines prepared to operate in the event of an Indonesian attack on West Iriam to make up the technical inadequacies of the Indonesian, unquote. So there is some evidence for Western sources that this might have been true. They might be about to take part in the attack, at least the submarines were. To end this talk, I'd like to talk about why Sukarno and Khrushchev operate in this way. Why did Sukarno ask the Soviet manned submarines and planes? Why was Khrushchev prepared to supply them and risk participating in the war against a member of NATO. There was a certain military need for Sakhalin to have Soviet personnel. The Jaya Vijay invasion fleet was going to sail from the Bangal Islands to Biak and carry out the attack. It had been very vulnerable with interception by the Royal Netherlands Navy. The Royal Netherlands Navy had in the area destroyers, frigates, and submarines. It was an experienced, well trained service a major threat to the Indonesian attack. Potentially, if the Indonesians had whiskey class submarines and TU-16 bombers armed with Cometa missiles, they could neutralize some of the Dutch naval assets. But the problem was the Indonesians did not have enough trained personnel. The Indonesian Defense Minister, Abdul Nasution, 
And this, this meant was that the training of Indonesian crews for TU-16s and submarines had not been completed at the time of the planned attack. A short of pilots and seamen manned equipment. The Indonesians could have delayed the large scale assault until the men were fully trained. But Sukarno was a man in a hurry. He wanted the Dutch New Guinea issue resolved in 1962, perfectly in time for his annual grand speech on Indonesian independence on the 17th of August. So the obvious solution for Sukarno is to have Soviets man Indonesian submarines and post down instead. It's also a possibility that Soviet Sukarno was using Soviet personnel as a way to apply diplomatic pressure. Although as they deployed the secret, this requires some subtlety. The Indonesian Soviet government never publicly revealed that the Soviet servicemen were manning submarines and aircraft. Indeed, Matthias Bombs has shown that although Marid, the Dutch Naval Intelligence Service, picked up fragments of evidence that the Dutch crews were there, they never seemed to inform the Dutch cabinet. So it therefore didn't influence Dutch decision making in the crisis. <laughs> but the Indonesians did give some hints to the Americans communications to the Americans. For example, on the 24th of July, Subandro warned Robert Kennedy that if Indonesians became involved in an armed conflict, quote, it meant the use of Russian personnel and weapons, and they know that such a conflict could not be restricted just to the local scene. So they quite strong hints to the Americans that there were some good personnel there. By doing this, they could let the Americans know that the attack would be effective to some extent. Be able to do some damage to the Dutch naval forces. <coughs> they also can play on American fears of growing Soviet influence in Indonesia. So I think that quite clear motives for the Sakana why they do this, to get back Dutch New Guinea. Christoph's motives are less immediately obvious, but there are two interpretations of his behaviour. <coughs> One is that he's trying to preserve the Soviet Union's relationship with Indonesia. Christopher put considerable effort into building up Soviet influence in Jakarta. He gave economic as well as military aid, and he personally visited Indonesia in 1960. So Moscow was competing with the Americans for Indonesian friendship, and Moscow was very unhappy about the Americans sponsoring negotiations, and even more so that Sukarno was willing to take part in negotiations. By meeting Sukarno's request for military support, Khrushchev could reinforce ties with Indonesia and encourage Indonesia to recover Dutch New Guinea by force, rather for American-led negotiations. But there's also the Cuban issue, which you're hearing about. In retrospect, looking back at the Cuban Missile Crisis and the West Syrian Crisis, the CIA speculated that there may have been a connection with the Soviet deployment of nuclear missiles in Cuba. The two operations were nearly contemporaneous. <laughs> Less than two weeks after approving the arms deal with Subandrio, Khrushchev proposed a Soviet Brazilian secretly installing nuclear missiles in Cuba. After some hesitation, the decision agreed. And while the Indonesia and Netherlands teased on the brink of war in July and August, the Soviet was simply slipping out nuclear weapons and a large conventional military force to Cuba. The CIA suggested that Moscow might have given Sukarno Soviet crews and encouraged them to attack Dutch New Guinea as a way to create a distraction. The agency observed that the Indonesian Dutch war in August and September 1962, quote, clearly would have provided a substantial diversion of world attention from other areas and potential cover for the Cuban buildup, unquote. So far as no evidence from Soviet sources that this did influence Christian, there's all speculation. But I do think it's likely he would have seen a possible benefit from a clash between the Dutch and Indonesians. At the same time, I was doing the operation in Cuba. So, some people still don't know the operation, but it is clear that Khrushchev gave Indonesia a remarkably generous level of military support over the Dutch New Guinea issue, particularly to risk embroiling the USSR in a war with NATO state and possible escalation to superpower confrontation. Khrushchev armed the Indonesians, he supplied them with submarines and bombers with Soviet crews and was seemingly willing to take part in an attack on the Dutch. This bulk intervention did not bring the USSR major benefits. Thanks to American diplomacy 
and the Indonesian Dutch war was averted. So there's no distraction from Cuba. Although the Pact has paid a price for this. In spite of all the Khrushchev support, the close military cooperation in 1962 was also only an aberration in Soviet Indonesian relations. In a couple of years, the Khan was pushing towards the Chinese side in the Sino Soviet split and moving away from Moscow. But after 1967, the Sukarno was toppled in Indonesia, aligned itself with the United States. So there's no long term benefits for the Soviet Union. Matthijs Rooks, Dutch uh, Naval Academy. Uh, a question. Uh, there was a lot of uh, evidence that there was an uh, Indonesian uh, invasion fleet preparing for an attack. Uh, did you find in the sources any interpretation of the intentions of the fleet? Because uh, from the Dutch side, they thought it would be used for a small scale attack or attack with uh, a limited goal uh, to enhance the uh, uh, negotiations. But in fact, it would be a, a full-scale attack. The Dutch thought that would never happen, a full-scale attack on their uh, military strong points. Uh, did you find any interpretations from the British or American side? Um, I can't remember the Dutch or the British American side, but uh, they were aware of that. But so it's true that the Indian attack seemed to be an all-or-nothing affair. From the Sutan's memoirs and um, Suharti's memoirs, they seemed to have shut only at once to try and capture the act and I hope we move on to Hollandia. Um, and that's where some skeptics of how successful that should be. It was we suit you in this event it was a gamble. If it failed, there was no way back after this. And I suspect this reflects a lot of Sukarno's style political leadership. Because um, the military themselves were quite nervous about starting a war. They wanted to wait until maybe 1963 attack at all. Um, but I don't see much in the British Americans like how aware they were the scale of the attack was going to be. Quite on one here again. First, a small comment that uh, for the Russians, for Khrushchev, one possible reason for him cultivating and supporting the nations was that he must have seen Sukarno and the Communist Party of Indonesia moving closer and closer to Beijing, given that Moscow had split with Beijing. This must have been a factor. 
But the question that I ask is, were the Americans aware that they were credible mediators in this? Because in 56, they were caught flat footed supporting an Indonesian breakaway rebellion. So that's only six years earlier. So Karno would have forgotten that. So Bandra would have forgotten that. How would they have seen the Americans? Uh, my big question point is for the British, what do the British records show their reading of the situation? Because immediately after this, you can't even turn to confront Malaysia, mm -hmm. in which the British were caught. Absolutely. I mean, I mean it's quite ironic because the British were telling their doubts that you must compromise, you must mm -hmm. do a deal with Indonesia, you have to try to keep Indonesia in the West more important than your colonies. And a year later, when you start to kind of um, threaten North Borneo and pose the question of Malaysia, the British are saying that's the opposite. The opposite saying, no, 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 we have to keep. Here, it's dangerous expansionist, these local communists are already, you've got to stop him now. So the British switch exception very, very quickly becomes their interest threatened rather than Dutch being threatened. That's the British Dutch didn't say, I thought we told you, so we warned you about Sukarno. I think you're right about the Americans also lacking credibility to a large extent in the needs, and also by the British as well, because when the British and the Americans fought with the rebellions in the islands in 1958, they were exposed quite quickly with the shooting down of the B25, known by a CIA pilot. And so, Sukarno was very, very suspicious of the West. So, the Americans were in some ways had to make an extra effort to try and persuade him. This is why they were so fearful they would fall into the Soviet camp. He wished to only exploit this. And, and so, sort of again, propaganda certainly was warning about the danger of the American imperialism, which is trying to replace the British and Dutch in the region. You should trust us, not them instead. And then they would be the point to say, look, they've done before, they were trying to copy you. Australia or the Dutch, which is monstrous, I agree with it, because it drops directly implicated. 